What's going on, guys? Welcome back to We Want Picks. My name is Jacob, aka the Freckled Salamander, here to bring you my quick pick video for UFC 2. 89 but before we get into ufc 289 make sure you like the video subscribe if you are new and as always make sure you go to we want picks.com become a premium member today it's only ten dollars a month and we are coming off surprise surprise another very successful week for the tire channel as a whole angels up units my picks were fantastic the live stream bets i was up like seven eight hundred dollars on the live stream bets make sure you get a chance to check out the live streams every saturday night we have a ton of fun doing them go to we want picks.com become a premium member Today. It's only ten dollars a month. Let's get right into a quick big video for UFC 289. Let's roll, baby. First up, we have Diana Belbita versus Maria Oliveira, and I'll tell you right now, these odds seem a little bit crazy to me because if you wanted to know who the better striker is in this matchup, and I believe it's going to be a mostly striking matchup, it's going to be Diana. And honestly, the people that Diana are going to be is going to be people that can't really wrestle her and people that don't have the power advantage over her because she is a very technical striker. The thing that she lacks is kind of that wrestling prowess and the, the, the power shot. She doesn't have that big knockout power. She doesn't have the big power to kind of hurt people. But she can out technical people. So if you don't have the power to beat her. And you don't have the wrestling to beat her. I don't know how you beat her. And, and Maria Oliveira, to her credit, she does have seven KO TKOs to her record. If you go and dive in into those records, the combined record of the people she has knocked out is four and 22. And the four wins come from one person who is four and four. So I don't think that she has the power advantage in this. I don't think that she's going to want to wrestle. She gets crazy, right? She's almost like an Elise Reed to that effect. She comes in. She gets crazy. If the crazy does not work, she will start to fade. I think Deanna can come in, withstand the crazy, and just touch, touch, touch. She's a tough girl in her own right, and just ones and twos, ones and twos, straight down the pipe, eventually start wearing down Maria in this fight, win the second round, maybe even find a finish in the third round. She looked pretty pissed off in that last fight against Gloria DePaula. Gloria DePaula was my lock of the week that week, but, you know, she, when that decision came, you could see in her face, Deanna was very upset. I think she comes in poised in front of her, you know, adopted home crowd in Canada and gets it done. Give me Deanna Belbita in my life, in my heart, and in this fight. Let's move on. David Dvorak versus Steven. This should be a pretty cut and dry fight for David. The issue with David when he fights is you just kind of wish that he would do more. But I think that was the competition that he was faced against, right? He was against Nikolau, who was a very dangerous opponent. He was against Manel Kopp, who was a very dangerous opponent. He was just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting and couldn't really find the entries that he wanted to find. He got some takedowns in the Manel Kopp fight, but this should be a much easier opponent. This dude, Steve to me, feels like the guy, I can't remember his name at this point, the guy that fought Jim Miller, right? Jim Miller, when I was breaking down that, looked like the most obvious knockout of all time because this guy did not move his head. And Steve, in this right, he wants to be on the ground. He wants to do his jujitsu thing. He wants to get on your back. But in the striking, this guy does not move his head. I mean, he is just head on the center line, getting lit up. I think David DeVore can let those hands loose, let those combinations fly. He's a very good striker and should honestly knock this guy out. If he wants to wrestle, he should be able to withstand the jujitsu of Steve, but... I think in the striking, he is going to be head and shoulders above advanced levels than this guy, Steve, Scuba Steve, in this fight. So give me the Vork all day, every day. I think he knocks this guy out. Let's move on. Blake Builder and Kyle Nelson. Listen, Kyle Nelson, to his credit, is a very well-rounded guy, right? He can wrestle. He can strike. He's tough. But the issue when I'm watching him, there's going to be a few people on this card you're going to hear me say, a little stiff. And nothing really jumps out to where like, oh my god, this guy does this really, really well. And to Blake's credit, that fight, UFC debut, big moment against a hometown kid. He came out, was a little bit slow, but he was very self-aware that he said, you know what, I give my, um, he said, I gave my performance an 8 out of 10 because I need to throw a little bit more volume. And I loved hearing that after the fight because in the beginning of the fight, it was like, man, this guy's just not doing anything, just dancing around, dancing around. But I'll give him credit, it was his UFC debut, but when he gets in the flow and he lets those hands go, he is a very, very good boxer, a very, very good striker, and he has the wrestling, too, in his back pocket. I think that's probably what he does the best. And Kyle Nelson, yeah, he can wrestle. 
I don't think he can out wrestle Blake. Kyle Nelson, yeah, he can strike, but he's a little stiff, a little head on the center line as well, and I don't believe that he is going to be the boxer at the level that Blake is as well. Undefeated guy. We'll see how he looks. Another pay-per-view. Time to shine in front of another hometown guy in Kyle Nelson, but I think Blake has all the tools to get this done. I don't know about inside the distance. I hope he does. Make it nice and easy for everyone because I know a lot of people are on the Blake side in this fight, but I ain't Blake all the way in this matchup. The high versus King Lang and this is going to be an interesting fight right because this is another one of those guys and I'm talking about Zahabi here when I'm watching Zahabi and I'm watching the odds move too I, I think Key Lang was like a minus 130 now it's almost a pick em fight I don't know how any I, I don't know how anyone can put money on Zahabi the way that I have watched him in film and the way that I have watched him fight I mean that guy is just nothing nothing Nothing. Throw a jab. Nothing. Nothing. Little one-two. Nothing. Nothing. I think Key Lang's a better striker. I think Key Lang is the more aggressive striker. And I think Key Lang has the power advantage in this fight. And he's finally going to fight somebody that shouldn't wrestle him. I mean, he has been struggling with these wrestlers or people that can wrestle as of late. I think this is a, a, a great matchup for Key Lang. Somebody that's going to stand in front of him, isn't good with the footwork in and out, isn't super fast, isn't super powerful, that will exchange a little bit, but it could be. I mean, and this is maybe this is why the odds are, are, are swaying the way. It could be, you know, Zahabi just kind of dancing around, point, 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 and Key Lang not being able to find him, and then kind of slowing down, and then Zahabi's able to win a weird decision. But I think Key Lang can get hands on this guy early. I think he's the better striker. He's shown he's got power. And Zahabi, just nothing, <laughs> nothing about Zahabi makes me be like, oh my God, yeah, I got to pick this guy. I got to put money on this guy. So I'm taking Key Lang in this fight. I think he's the better striker and the more dangerous striker and isn't going to get taken down in this fight. I, I, I hope not by Zahabi. So give me Key Lang in this matchup. Let's move on. Asman versus Miranda. And this one is like, and you're going to hear Angelo say it. There's probably going to be some other people saying it as well. I mean, Miranda Maverick at minus 300 after her last performance as a minus 600, minus 500 favorite, whatever she was, is absolutely insane. She has shown no improvements in her striking, and her wrestling isn't as dominant as people pretend that it is. And Jasmine is a wrestler. I, you know, she is not a great striker in her own right. She showed off her incredible toughness against Natalia, showed off toughness in her last fight, and was able to you know take down the big girl, um, a, a much bigger, stronger girl. And she's going to be the taller opponent in this matchup versus Miranda. I think this is a pick em fight. I, I, I believe that on the feet, it's kind of a wash. I believe in the wrestling, it's kind of a wash. But when it comes down to it, and I and I got to rely on toughness and somebody that I believe is going to push comes to shove, give that extra effort, give that extra step, win that last scramble in front of the home fans, I got to go with Jasmine in this matchup, man. I, I, I honestly believe that these are, they almost wash each other as far as uh, attributes and abilities. And it's going to come down to toughness. And I saw the toughness against Natalia Silva. Listen, she got steamrolled. She couldn't touch Natalia Silva. But we know who Natalia Silva is at this point. And she was still chasing. She was still trying to get to her, still trying to work, still trying to get to her. And I've just seen Miranda flat on her back too many times, not working out of those positions. So I'm going with Jasmine in this matchup. I think the value at minus or plus 250. 265, whatever it is right now, is insane. Give me Jazzin to pull off the upset in front of the hometown fans against Miranda. Let's move on. Nazardine Imava versus Chris Curtis, and this is an in to resting fight. Listen, I'm a Chris Curtis fan. I actually picked Imavov against Sean Strickland. I can't remember if he was, I don't think it was my lock of the week, but I did pick him against Sean Strickland because I believed in this guy. And this is probably going to look very similar, right? Because Chris Curtis fights very, very similar as Sean Strickland. The difference is, Sean Strickland, when he is moving forward, he is throwing volume moving forward, right? He's stalking, he's stalking, but he's throwing the jab, he's throwing the jab, he's throwing the one-two, he's throwing the one-two, and he's mixing in kicks. He showed some kicks in his last fight, and he was mixing in some level changes as well that kind of threw off Imavov, and Imavov eventually was kind of broken down in that five-round five, five round fight. This is a three-round fight. Chris Curtis does walk people down, but... He doesn't really throw as he's stalking people, but he has much more power than Sean Strickland. So this is going to sound weird, but I believe this to be true. 
this is going to be an easier fight for Imavov as far as he's going to be able to do a little bit more what he wants to do without the constantly getting jabbed and getting hit. But it's a much more dangerous fight against Chris Curtis because Chris Curtis is a very, very, very durable guy. And he's got crazy power when he does throw those combinations. So this is what I will say. I believe that Chris Curtis, this is a make or break Chris Curtis fight. He's either going to come in, stalk, land a big knockout shot against a very hittable opponent in Imavov, or he's going to have that Chris Curtis fight where he's stalking, 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 doesn't do anything like the Jack Hermanson fight, and it, it, it almost looks like a fool again in this fight. But I believe the stalking style mixed with the power, Chris Curtis is going to find the knockout shot against Imavov. I, I'm a little bit biased because I do like Chris Curtis. I've picked him, I think, in like every single fight that he's had in the UFC. So I've been right more than I've been wrong. But I think Chris Curtis can land the power. And if he lands the power, he could definitely sleep this guy, Imavov. So it's a close fight. We'll see how it plays out. But Chris Curtis is my official pick. Move on. Eric Anders versus Mark Andre. And Mark Andre, for some reason, I have no hate for this guy, but I have picked him twice uh, against Lock of the Week. I, I, I picked um, Jordan Wright as my Lock of the Week against Mark Andre. I picked uh, Julian Marquez as my Lock of the Week against, against Mark Andre. Let me say right now, Eric Anders is not going to be the Lock of the Week. Don't, don't worry about the underdog Lock of the Week. Let me start first with Eric Anders because he is a super. Super athletic guy, but he is another one of those guys where crazy athletic, but for some reason in the octagon looks stiff to me. I mean, he just looks like everything is just a thought out process. There's no just real free flowing striking. And Mark Andre is kind of the exact opposite. He just kind of gets in the fight, started slow a little bit against Julian Marquez, and I was I was at the fight at UFC 288 or 285 by the way, feeling good about myself, and then turned on that pace, turned on that pressure, and yes. Eric Anders found some some drops and some knockouts against Kyle Dawkins in his last fight, but that's Kyle Dawkins. Everyone's been dropping him. He came off that that big headbutt KO against Kevin. I mean, that's to be seen. Uh, Eric Anders, he did what he was supposed to do against Kyle Dawkins. I don't think he can have that same power, that same success against the boxing of Mark Andre. I think it's a close first round, and then Mark Andre does what he does, right? Volume, volume, volume starts taking over. Eric Anders is a very durable guy. I don't expect him to get finished, but if you want to play like a second, third round finish for Mark Andre in front of the home crowd, power bar, going to be powered up. I guarantee he wants to get a finish. It could happen in a second. Could happen in the third round. I don't think Eric Andres can get the power to Mark Andre. So, power bar. Mark Andre is my pick for this fight. Dan Ige versus Nate the Train. 50K Dan Ige. Let me say, everyone knows my history. If you don't know my history with Nate Landwehr, one of the greatest lock of the weeks of all time versus David Onama. I was a big fan of his. I'm still a big fan of his. I'm going to pick him in this fight, but don't put money on Nate Landwehr. I'm picking him because it is a biased pick. I'm picking him with my heart, but I think that he can get absolutely steamrolled in this fight because, you know, Nate the Train wins fights when he can just break people down. That's why I picked him against David Onama. I could see that David Onama, uh, David Onama, David Onama can break in fights, and that's exactly what Nate did. Now, David Onama actually didn't break completely. He showed a lot of heart in that fight. I think he's going to be better for it, but Nate cannot break Dan Ige. Dan Ige is just as tough, just as durable, and he's going to be the much better boxer in this matchup, as good as Nate the Train is, and he's a well-rounded fighter. That guy gets hit, and he gets hit in the pocket. And the power that Dan Ige possesses in the pocket, in those exchanges, is absolutely insane. And Dan Ige is also very accomplished on the ground and grappling as well. So the way that Nate needs to win this fight is he's got to jump on Dan early. He's got to get respect early, jump on him early, and try to make Dan play catch up, right? You got to control the octagon. You got to push forward. But Nate, a lot of times, will kind of wait and wait and wait and then wait to see when a fighter is breaking, and that's when he starts jumping on him. And Dan, he's not going to break. If you give him space early, if you let him do his thing early, he's not going to break. Even if you jump all over him, he's probably not going to break, and he's going to be the better boxer in this matchup. So my pick is Nate Landwehr, but don't listen to me at all. It is a biased pick. Dan Ige, honestly, I think, should kind of roll in this matchup, unfortunately, but my pick is Nate the Train, baby. Let's move on to the next one. Mike Malott versus Adam. Fuck it. I'm telling you right now that I 
I, my pick is going to be Mike Millot. I think so, he, yeah, I think he gets it done. He probably gets it done early. He's a very well-rounded guy. He's got the grappling. He's got the striking. The guy does get it. I'm not completely sold on Mike Malat yet, especially because he's just got so many first-round finishes. And this dude, Adam Fuggett, is a very tough guy. He's a tough guy. He's got the wrestling. He wants to use his offensive wrestling. I don't think he's going to be able to, right? And when I'm watching him, he's another one of those guys that just is so stiff in the yacht. Got everything is just so tight. There's just no real free-flowing action to anything he does. And Mike Malat is it's much more of a free-flowing type guy. So... I believe Mike Millot is the more well-rounded fighter. Adam Fuggett, to win this fight, I think he needs to get on hips early. He's got to shoot takedowns early. The longer that this goes, which sounds stupid, but the longer this goes, and the second that Mike Malott's able to find his range, able to kind of gauge the distance, maybe shoot a level change himself, if he's able to get on top of Adam, it's going to be bad news for Adam in this fight. Adam's got to be the aggressor here. He cannot wait. He's got to get in the face. He's got to get respect early. He's got to level change. He's got to get him down. He's got to put some doubt in the mind of Mike Malott, and I just don't think he's going to do that. I think he comes in, tries to gauge, tries to gauge, and before he knows that Mike Malott's going to be lighting him up with the strikes, are going to be taking him down, grabbing his back, grabbing his neck, something like that to that effect. So Mike Malott is going to be my pick, but I'm not completely sold. I mean, a lot, a lot of people are saying that he's going to steamroll Adam. He could. He could get another first round finish. I'm picking him, so I hope he does, but I'm going to wait and see until he goes through a war, and I know that he can overcome adversity in fights before I really start laying big money on him. So, Mike Ballot is a pick. Let's move on. Co-main event, which is really kind of the people's main event. We're going Charles Oliveira versus Benny Darius, and I am, a, I would say, a little bit biased against Darius. I never thought that he was that great. I said that Gamrot was going to absolutely steamroll him, but the things I saw in that Gamrot fight makes me feel a little bit better about Charles Oliveira. Let me first start with, with, with Oliveira. In that Islam fight, I believe in my mind that the pressure got to him a little bit too much. You saw in the first round how anxious he was. And I know that he usually comes out aggressive. I know he usually he's always in, he's always pressing. Shoot the box style. He's always in people's faces. He's always pressuring people. But it's usually a little bit more of a dialed-in pressure. He came out throwing that crazy kick, got right in Islam's face. I believe that he was trying too much and was putting a little bit too much pressure on himself and was kind of pressing himself a little bit too much in the first round of that fight. And when he got knocked down, when he was taken down in the guard, I think he was surprised that his guard game was not working as well as he thought it was going to against a guy like Islam. So then when it came to the second round, he was like, oh man, like now what do I do? Because I thought I would have success in the striking. He dropped me. I thought I would have success off my back. I didn't. And then he tried to kind of offensive wrestle, got taken down. The arm triangle is there. It is what it is. So I believe, especially kind of a, a, a revenge type fight, a three round fight, I think that Charles Oliveira is going to be a little bit more dialed in, a little bit more methodical and calculated in his attack. The issue is he does get dropped. Every single person drops him that fights him. And Darius does drop people. I mean, that guy has heavy, heavy hands. He throw, he will throw wild. He will come forward as well because he doesn't care if you try to take him down because he knows that he can outscramble. But the thing that I like here in favor of Charles Oliveira is if you watch the Gamrot fight, Gamrot was able to get to him, right? It was able to almost get him down to the knees all the time. And the way that Darius was defending takedowns was not sprawling, was not defending. He did it a couple times, but a lot of times it was Gamrot getting to him and Darius rolling through positions. And the difference between Gamrot and Charles Oliveira is Gamrot wants to roll through those positions to end up on top. Gamrot does not want to fight on the bottom. He doesn't want to go to 50-50 positions. He wants to be in total top control. So he will continue to roll through positions to get control and Darius was able to outscramble him in those positions. If this goes to the ground, if Charles is able to avoid the pressure or I mean the power of their use and they start rolling around and their use thinks that he's just going to roll through positions against a, a guy like Charles Oliveira. Charles Oliveira is much more high level in those type of jiu-jitsu roles than Gamrot. And he doesn't mind just kind of playing that guard game, playing the, the the weird leg locks, playing the weird, you know, you know, throwing up triangles or arm bars and stuff, stuff that Gamrot will not do. So if their use thinks that he's just going to roll through positions against uh, Oliveira like he was against Gamera. I think he could get caught against another high-level guy like Charles Oliveira. I understand that Darius is very, very high-level, but... Oliveira will do the weird stuff that Gamrot was not willing to do, that other people are not willing to do. So, 
With that said, the co-main event, I am taking Charles Oliveira. I can't pick against a guy that's looked so good. I'm going to take that Islam fight as just a little bit of a flyer. Came in a little bit tight. Was trying to do a little bit too much. This is three rounds. I hope that he can avoid the power of Darius, but I think that Charles Oliveira can get this done. I hope there's some scrambles. I hope that he's able to show off his wild stuff in scrambles. Catch Darius in some weird positions. He's been submitted before. I'm taking Charles Oliveira. The champ has a name, and his name is Charles Du Bronx Oliveira. Let's go to the main event. Main event time for UFC 289. We have Amanda Nunes versus my girl, Irene Adana. And let me say, I love my Mexican. Viva Mexico, Mexican tough. I absolutely love my Mexicans. And there's a reason for it. They are absolutely insanely tough. Tough. I do not believe in my mind that Amanda Nunes is going to come in and KO or TKO Aldana. She's just way too tough. I also will say this. There's, let, me just, let me just start off with saying like this. There are three things that are true. There are three things that are true. Number one, Amanda Nunes is beatable. She's not just this inhumane, inhumane. She's not just this unhuman person that can't be beat. We've seen it. It's happened a little bit ago. She can be beat. That's number one. She can be beat. Number two, she does get hit. You saw that in, obviously in the first Pena fight. She's been hit. She's been hit by everyone, but in that first Pena fight, she was getting lit up, getting lit up, tried to chase a KO, got tired, and got finished. In the second Pena fight, yes, she was dominating that fight, and she absolutely dominated that fight, but even in that fight, she was still getting hit. Pena at times was still Hitting her in that matchup. That leads me to third point. Number three, Aldana, in my mind, is a much better boxer than Amanda Nunes. I think if you put boxing gloves on these girls in a boxing ring and just have them purely box, Aldana wins that fight seven out of ten times. I really believe in her boxing style, the way that she possesses power in combinations in her hands, I believe that she is the better boxer than Amanda Nunes. The issue is, and the thing that's the biggest red flag of all, it might not even matter. This fight all comes down to, is Amanda Nunes going to fight her pride? Is she going to try and knock out Aldana like she did Julia Pena in the first fight? Or is she going to come in, business-like, defend her title, shoot takedowns, take Aldana down, and submit her. Because I don't think she's going to ground and pound her. She's going to need to submit to finish Aldana. So this is going to come down to Amanda Nunes. Does she come in? Can Irene get in her face, touch her early, fight the pride? Because I said that with Juliana Pena. If you guys listened to my fight breakdown for Juliana Pena, Amanda Nunes, number one, I said, Juliana's just got to touch her. Just touch her, touch her, touch her. Because Amanda Nunes does have a little bit of Cody Garbrandt in her. Not that she gets knocked out. But she's a prideful fighter. And if she starts getting hit, she wants to hit you back. I think a lot of fighters are like that. It's like, no, fuck that. Like, you're trying to hit me. I'm going to try and hit you back. And Nunes, when she's trying to hit people back, gets loopier and loopier and loopier. And Aldana's just so clean. Boom, boom, boom. In the pocket. So, if Aldana is able to fight the pride of Amanda Nunes, turn this into a kickboxing match, she is going to be very live in this matchup. Her, 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 her boxing is very clean. She's much better than Pena, possesses much more power than Pena, and her leg kicks are absolutely destroying her. I mean, she throws heavy, heavy leg kicks that could end up deterring Amanda from pressuring and shooting takedown. So Irene has got to get to Amanda early. She's got to touch her early. She's got to touch her leg early. So if Nunez wants to wrestle, by the time she decides to wrestle, it's going to be too late for her. But if Amanda comes in with a business-like game, business game plan and is just shooting takedowns immediately, shooting takedowns immediately, grounding, grounding, ground and pound, looking for submissions, Nunez will win this fight. But I believe, that Irene Aldana is going to come in, jab, jab, one, two. Nunes is going to be like, uh-uh, you're not touching me like that. Here's a big overhand right. Here's a big overhand right. Here's a big, oh, oh shit. Here's a big overhand left. Oh, shit. Okay, now I want to wrestle. Oh, my God, I didn't get the takedown. Oh, my God, let me, now I got to try and knock her out again. Oh, my God, now I'm getting tired. Oh, my God, now I'm getting, oh, my nose is bleeding. Oh, my God, oh, what is going on? Oh, I'm, I'm throwing another overhand right. Oh, my God, I just lost my belt. Irene Aldana, hashtag and new. I think that she can fight the ego of Amanda. I think that she can finish her. Knock her out, maybe even win a decision. But if Amanda wants to come in and wrestle, 
it could be easy for him. But my official pick is going to be Irene Aldana. Get the job done. UFC 289. This has been my quick pick video for UFC 289. Make sure you like the video. Subscribe if you are new. Go to WeWantPicks.com. Become a premium member today. It is only $10 a month. My name is Jake Baker. I'm out.